we'll get started. I am Matt Knudsen. I am the Chief Diversity Officer at the New York State Office of Mental Health. And we welcome everyone to today's webinar, Addressing Community Grief and Trauma Caused by Racism and Violence. Now, I want to make a special mention here um, prior to talking about Buffalo specifically, and I also wanted to recognize um, the tragic activities and event that happened in Texas over the last couple of days. And I wanted to, um, on behalf of the state, give our heartfelt condolences to the community in Texas and also recognize um, that these events, much like the one that we're going to talk about more specifically, really call on levels of community resilience and healing that are widespread, but that the trauma of these activities is also compounding. Um, for example, you know, I want to, you know, just be transparent and talk about this specifically. Um, you know, one of the speakers that we had today from the University of Buffalo, a woman of color who was going to be with us because of the events in Buffalo and then because of the um, shooting in Texas was unable to join us today just over the trauma and the emotional response that she was having. So I think that that really sets the tone, I think, for um, what we're going to be covering today and the topic. Um, so we just wanted to point that out in advance. Um, so the thing that I wanted to say is, 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 is to just start is, is to just say that we join all New Yorkers in expressing grief and sadness um, you know, over the situation that took place in Buffalo. We're extremely focused on sharing, providing that we're providing both long and short term support to those communities in need in Buffalo, but not only in Buffalo, because we have to again recognize, and I've been saying this a lot over the last couple of days um, and weeks, is just making sure that we recognize that your proximity to the actual events in Buffalo um, really doesn't mean that you might not be having tra trauma responses. We can expect that nationally, if somebody's a person of color, um, that specific event is going to have an additional significance in their lives because it compounds. Um, people of color in, 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 in America are already living lives in which they're facing hate crimes and microaggressions and um, the daily life, right? is one in which people experience racism. So when something like this happens, it really re-traumatizes and causes an additional level of compounding trauma on individuals. Um, so we recognize that Buffalo, and there's a whole bunch of things that we'll talk about specific to the supports in Buffalo, um, but we also wanna make sure that people understand that we really need to look out for our communities across the state particularly in people of, who are people of color, um, to make sure that they're getting um, their emotional needs met around last week and then this week's events. Today's mission is to help New Yorkers understand how to assist individuals, families, and youth coping with grief and trauma caused by the horrific event. We're gonna provide general information about the mental health effects of racism and violence, crisis response, and helping others cope with grief and trauma. Specific information focused on children and youth will also be provided. Now specifically, and we wanna point this out in a, in, a, in a very specific way, is that we're talking about there's going to be an additional focus on communities of color and on individuals of color and youth of color because of the unique nature of the Buffalo situation where an individual targeted, you know, you know, targeted the black community very specifically, it's going to resonate and, you know, there's going to be a different response that's going to be had by people who are black individuals. Um, but to just provide some additional context and some of the things that we already know and that we already talk about 
is the social determinants of health have historically prevented communities of color from having equal opportunities for economic, physical, and emotional health. We know about the disparities that already exist, whether it comes to criminal justice involvement, or it comes to um, economic self-sufficiency, or, or, or educational attainment, um, or home ownership. These are all areas in which you know the black community and communities of color in New York State and America um, have not had equal access. And historical and current experiences of racism contribute to a mistrust of the healthcare system among racial and ethnic minority groups. And experiencing racism and discrimination is proven to have a direct impact on an individual's mental and physical health. And I always make that point, and I want that to be clear. Um, racism is a social determinant of health by itself. So the effect of being the victim of discrimination, microaggressions, and all of the different things that come, you know, at the end of being a person of color in New York State and in America, um, they actually have a psychological impact on us, and it's and it's scientifically proven. And lastly, the COVID nineteen pandemic, right? Um, because this sadly was another example, right? Um, of 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 kind of, you know, an example because of the the higher rates of infection and higher rates of death, specifically in the black community. Um, there's obviously going to be, you know, a higher rate of psychological trauma um, that the event in Buffalo um, already hit a community that was already suffering and already living through a higher disproportionate burden of COVID. So I want people to kind of look at the situation in Buffalo, not as isolated, um, but look at it, you know, in a way that this was an additional thing that already comes into a troubling and problematic um, context. Today's speakers, I'm Matt Knudsen. I am the New York State Office of Mental Health Chief Diversity Officer. Um, we're also joined today by Stephen Moskowitz, is who, who is the New York State Office of Mental Health Bureau of Emergency Preparedness and Response. And we are especially, especially lucky today to have Keith Alford, Dr. Alford from the University of Buffalo School of Social Work, where he is a Dean and Professor and from Buffalo, um, currently in Buffalo, not from Buffalo, he reminds me every time I say that, currently in Buffalo, um, to provide some additional localized context about trauma in the black experience and how this specific event um, you know, needs to be taken um, to be able to help community healing. Now, to talk a little bit more generally about traditional response and recovery and, 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 and to kind of talk people through a little bit of this is that attention is commonly directed towards the immediate physical health and community infrastructure risks in the aftermath of traumatic events. But what we're going to talk about today is what is a little bit different, and, and, and we're going to differentiate the situation in Buffalo um, from what is a traditional situation that you have. Um, so mass violence is unlike other disasters. Loss of life is substantial. Um, it's more important, obviously, than the loss of property, right? One. Two, it really shatters a sense of safety and safe places um, are no are no longer places that people feel safe, right? So we think about schools or we think about the grocery store, right? The grocery store is, is the place that we all go and is a place that generally in our minds, you know, is the general expectation and belief that it's going to be a place that you're going to be able to go free, you know, um, from violence or free from anything that could potentially harm you. So it really shatters, you um, I think people's ability to feel safe. And the other thing is that the grocery store specifically is a place where people are going to have one of the most basic needs met, right? Which is to get food, right? So the fact now that the trauma and the fear in meeting one of your most basic needs, making sure that you and your family have food, shattering that especially has given a, a, a greater level of trauma to the community. And I know that um, we'll talk specifically about some of the response at the state level 
um, and at the local level. But that's one of the things that is being addressed in Buffalo specifically is the people that were in the most affected community are able to now have access to food because of food resources that were set up um, very immediately after the event. Lastly, a couple things that make mass violent, violence different, um, obviously, is, is, is the aspect that we're talking about innocent victims. Um, and in this case, you know, this slide says sometimes, but I'll talk very specifically in this case, a specific population was targeted. Next slide. In the Buffalo mass shooting, this atrocity is different because, like I said, it targeted a specific group of people, black people, because of the nature of the event. This is something that we can expect and it's natural. Topics of race, racism and identity are going to be pushed to the forefront in our general conversations that everybody has with people as well as in the response. Right? So these additional issues must be addressed head on. Right? In order for us to facilitate both personal and then community level healing. It's not the, the, the elephant in the room is not going to be able to be the elephant, um, <laughs> elephant in the room. It needs to be addressed, um, you know, head on. And that's something that is the way that we're approaching this. There's obviously going to be additional racial mistrust, um, just because of the nature of what the event was. In the aftermath of this event, all major focuses on the psychological impact of the violence and what it has had on those in the community. And like I said, people in the statewide community. Our response is to provide mental health support to local, state, and federal partners. Some of the partners include the County Department of Mental Health, New York State Office of Emergency Management, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, the American Red Cross, and then also a number of the great organizations on the ground in Buffalo. Um, I will I will list none because I'm not going to be able to list out um, everyone and I don't want to leave anybody out. But Buffalo has a very rich black community um, and there's a lot of counseling and support and healing taking place both in the human service sector as well as um, in the faith community. Now to discuss the various types of support direct counseling services to impacted communities, the development and distribution of information, coordination of services, and seeking financial resources to support ongoing efforts. Those are all in general terms, what, you know, our last, most people that I've been working with here has been the majority of our, you know, work days has been focused exclusively on, you know, addressing those main buckets of activity. The disaster response activities are disaster mental health counseling, project hope counseling, public webinars and training, which this is, and addressing both the immediate and then long-term needs of the communities that are impacted. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Steve Moskowitz um, to cover some of this information that we're currently covering now. Thank you, Matt. So New York Project Hope is one of the resources that Matt just mentioned. And New York Project Hope is, is a federally funded program that was stood up by the Office of Mental Health to address the challenges that people were experiencing from COVID-19. So this, this uh, initiative has been around for two years now and lends itself very well to extending itself to help the people in the community in Buffalo. And that's because the challenges that we talk about uh, in as being addressed during COVID um, are very similar to some of the challenges that are experienced by those folks um, who have experienced the violence in Buffalo. The two key components of Project HOPE include the Emotional Support Helpline, and that's the number you see here, the 1-844-863-9314. That's a helpline that's available seven days a week with live counselor support. So anybody that is feeling challenged by the events 
uh, by COVID, by the events that specific to the shootings in Buffalo, or by a general sense of being overwhelmed by all of what's going on, can feel free to avail themselves of the assistance of a counselor, a trained crisis counselor, who will pick up the phone seven days a week and and talk to you um, and support you in the challenges that you're facing. You can also visit the New York Project Hope website, uh, a very non-traditional resource because this website was constructed during the period of COVID when we had to rely on virtual communication where we could not reach people uh, door to door, we couldn't reach them in person, constructed a website that was highly interactive and very much focused on assisting people being part educational, part resource, um, and, and part entertainment. And I say that because one of the things that we recognize is people need relief from stress as well. So one of the one of the, the, the interesting items you'll find on the website is a section that allows you to take a little bit of mental time out to engage you in an activity that's a little bit distracting. The goal here to teach and to help people find a place where they can compose themselves, where they can feel a little bit more relaxed, hopefully safer. Uh, and as I said, also contains multiple resources. So, Matt, I'm going to toss this back to you to continue to talk about some of the challenges that are incurred by mass violence. Thank you, Steve. Now, the impact of mass violence is widespread and to a varying degree affects victims, responders in the community at large. And I think that that's one of the things um, that we've really seen firsthand in the work that we've been doing in Buffalo is that responders in the are also affected. And that's one of the things that we're providing additional resources to is making sure that we're um, addressing burnout and trauma and vicarious trauma of the people that are also delivering the services. That's extremely important. Incidents of violence can result in more serious and long-term lasting psychological effects and other disasters. I think that that's something that we definitely need to keep on our radar, and that's part of the reason why we need to have such a long-term, consistent, um, you know, flow of services and support to the area. Other disasters have taught us that there are different points, six months, a year later, two years later, where you then see increased rates of suicide, increased rates of substance use, um, and those types of things, which are the normal responses oftentimes the trauma, but we definitely need to make sure that we are providing consistent services um, to get ahead of that and in the future. Mass violence is also particularly hard to comprehend. So that is, I think, the other piece that, you know, we can see happening in all of our minds when the event happens, right? We're all wondering why. We're all wondering, you know, what the the, the what would have prevented it? There's that scrambling in your mind of, of that is, and, and it's interesting, that's a trauma response, right? And in these cases, everybody's looking at what could have prevented it, what could have stopped it, but that's a part of what happens because it's so hard and the difference being that these, you know, the situation is at the hands of another human being as opposed to something that, you know, you could just know from, you know, the, the earth science class you took in high school, like a flood or an earthquake, you can have a concrete understanding of very easily of, of, of what the reason was. Um, and the impact of multiple traumatic events can feel overwhelming and leading to hopelessness. And again, I think that that's really why we're calling upon, you know, not only as government, not only as me as a person of color or as a dad or as a New Yorker, um, we're really recognizing that there's a real need for deep level societal healing that needs to take place because all of the events, again, COVID, um, you know, a, 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 a complex political environment, um, you know, additional violence, um, increased crime. These are all things um, that all of us as human beings are struggling with right now. And we need to have long-term healing 
processes in place because it's all compounding and each one of these events or factors is not something that's um, you know, isolated. Now, hate-based violence threatens or harms the victims and also is intended to send a message to the entire community in which the victims belong. And that's the part that made this situation different. Um, and that's part why it's more difficult, I think, for a lot of us um, to, to comprehend or to make sure that, that we're addressing appropriately. Um, the traumatic effect is compounded for the group, in this case, Black and African Americans, um, in this case, because of um, race and racism. And, and to point out that, it's not you know, just African Americans, um, other groups, you know, in, in, in feedback that we've been getting, whether it be New York's immigrant communities, um, Jewish people in New York have all had an out, um, outpouring of, of, of messaging to us around the fact that they are triggered as well by the events just because of the related um, discrimination um, and similar things that they've suffered so from and continue to. So I think that, you know, it's important to mention that that while we are on one hand saying that we need to target and specifically look at the different ways that this is going to affect black New Yorkers, we also have to realize um, that it is also triggering for other people. Um, and the other thing is that we need to realize that many impacted families and community members experience multiple losses at once that might not be related to the specific event in Buffalo. Um, but we, we know that, um, you know, that there's other factors that also play in other ways loss is also impacting families and we need to take that into account. Now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Alford to provide the next few slides. Thank you very much. And here we are again looking at this in a, in a broader level reference to hate-based violence and racial trauma. These effects are on top of racial trauma from individual and societal level bias and discrimination, which have impacts on mental and physical health. I think that's so important to be mindful of is that we, we tend to think about how this type of violence is mentally overwhelming, mentally exhausting, psychologically draining, but it also can have a physiological impact on us as well. And rightly so, when we think about how the intensity of uh, what took place, the shock of what took place has reverberated throughout the community. In the last few years, uh, there has been disproportionate impacts of COVID-19 police related violence and economic losses in communities of color, particularly black communities. And I think that's a piece that we have to emphasize as well. In our quest to embrace diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility, we have to be intentional and purposeful in terms of the populations that we're referencing. In this case, the losses, uh, economic losses, economic uh, inequities, if you will, impact of the worldwide pandemic, and of course, uh, police related violence, again, racial injustice, has had what I refer to as a pandemic trifecta uh, on the black community. These communities have higher barriers to accessing mental health treatment oftentimes, communities of color referencing. Now, does that mean that mental health treatment isn't available? Does that mean that mental health treatment isn't being infused? No, it means that we need to make sure that when there are areas of concern where additional mental health treatment is needed or that there may be pockets where mental health provision is not as plentiful, how are we moving in in a positive way to see that need met? Next slide. So understanding the impact in overall sense, everyone, everyone touched by the attack, in this case, the mass shooting that took place right here in the community of Buffalo. Everyone is affected. Everyone is affected. And so we know in 
the Buffalo mass shooting of May 14, 10 lives were snuffed out. Hands of white supremacists. Understanding, though, that there are also 10 lives impacted. And a community impacted a race of people. And I would continue to say humanity. So everyone touched by an attack is affected in some way. Stress, anxiety, and grief are common reactions to uncommon situations. And that plays out in the workplace. It plays out at home. And it also plays out in our daily interactions. So we have to, uh, should I say, give grace uh, when we know that this is happening simply because it pans out in a way that may be different for one person compared to the next person, but the impact is great. Responses are varied. Certainly in reference to individual impact as well as collective impact. And you also may be surprised with your own reaction. And of course, as we know, reactions can change over time. Time can bring about change from the standpoint of how we are coping with the event, how we also may be triggered again, or some people refer to it as a trauma reminder again of the event, clearly happening even as we speak with the horrific shooting at Robb Elementary in Texas from yesterday. Next slide. And so when we think about dramatic stress, we have to think about it from the standpoint that it has uh, the power to overwhelm our coping abilities. It does have the power to overwhelm our coping abilities. So if you feel intense or overwhelming emotions, that's actually a normal a reaction or a typical reaction. And it does not mean that you will feel that way in the long term or forever. But again, there may be periods where you will revisit, or should I say, there may be a trauma reminder where those intense feelings feel like they're brand new all again. Most people feel better and safer over time with support and coping skills, which is a critical piece to bear in mind because support is vital. It is absolutely vital. Vital from the standpoint of assessing what support systems are already in place and vital from the standpoint of being present, meaning support systems being present over the long haul. Here in the community of Buffalo, there are a number of support systems that are infusing themselves in a proactive way to assist the black community, doing it in tangible ways, as well as continuing to offer support um, virtually. There are many virtual gatherings where folks have had the opportunity to really just express their feelings, talk about their inability to cope, and also even talk about solutions. And some people might say, well, how can you talk about solutions when you're experiencing grief at the same time? We can hold those two things simultaneously. It's important to watch out for yourself and for others so that you can help, or so that you can get the help, should I say, uh, that is needed. Next slide. And so this is a slide that speaks to collective grief and trauma in the black community. And my colleague and friend, Matthew, do you want to take that slide? Yeah, I want to talk now a little bit about collective grief and trauma. Um, and it's important to point out that individual loss and grief in the is in the context of collective unceasing grief. Collective grief is in the historical context. Um, and we have to think about it no differently than the broader pieces of enslavement, structural inequity, historical and ongoing racial violence, and staggering loss. Um, you know, one of the things that I want to point out as well is that in addition, um, for example, this is, is, is right today, is an example um, of what I mean here is that this is also the anniversary of George Floyd's death. Um, and I think that, you know, that just kind of gives you know, in a, in, a, in a real perfect way of an example of what we mean here by this stuff is compounding. The other thing that I'll point out is that 
there. And I, it, 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 the research does show us um, that stress and anxiety is increased in people of color when there's events that are on the news, again, that have nothing, that, that, that might be completely across the country. You have to remember that because of social media and because of the 24-hour news cycle, something might happen in a complete another part of the world or the country, and that could equally have the same tragic and, um, you know, traumatic effect on the individuals. So it's important to note that these things are compounding, and that's something that we need to take care of and look at these events as. One of the resources that we have created um, at the Office of Mental Health is the Coping with Racism and Racial Trauma resource. Um, and this is a resource that everybody's going to have a chance to have the links to, um, whether or not you're a lay person out in the community, um, whether or not you work in the mental health system, whether or not you're a clergy person, whether or not you work in the school systems, it's important that people have an understanding about the ways that we can address racial trauma. Um, and there's a number of different steps and there's a number of different, you know, best practices that, you know, we worked with OMH's lead psychologist in the creation of this um, resource. And one is finding a role model or mentor. Um, talking about your experiences is another key thing, not, you know, isolating and not keeping your thoughts and your feelings all to yourself. Name what you're feeling as you feel it. When your emotions are a reaction to racism, label the connection. It's empowering and it's invalidating, but that's part of the reason why we're being so out front and we're being so public or we're being so saying the word racism often, right? Because not too long ago in American society, in New York um, as well, the topic was still something that that's it, it's a taboo. It makes people uncomfortable. They don't want to talk about it. And because of that, people have suffered in silence, whether or not they're getting discriminated on in the workplace, or it just is this huge elephant in the room that that doesn't serve society well, right? And it's almost like how you look at a family, right? A family traumatic, a family unit, right? And maybe a family has some trauma and has these secrets that nobody talks about and nobody brings to light in the same way as a society, it happens the same way, right? And what that leads you is that you have this big elephant in the room that is not addressed and not talked about, but what does that lead to? That leads to a whole group of people who are the victims feeling absolutely completely invalidated, right? Because it's not a conversation that everybody is taking a part in. And I mean, I think it's important to mention that in this situation, allies are critical. Allies need to understand racial trauma. Allies need to also understand um, sometimes the response that they might get when they're offering support, it might not be as welcoming as you would think it would be, but that people have to understand that part of that is a response to trauma. And we've been getting that. You know, I've been getting my white colleagues and people have said, I don't know my place here. or I don't know what to say, or I don't know how to be valuable. But one of the things that we wanted to point out is that you do play an important role. And the biggest role is holding space for the grieving and the trauma and the healing that needs to take place. And I think that what we wanna do is also provide more educational supports on what is you know, the role of the ally here, because I think that we want to make sure that people are comfortable in being able to provide support, um, but doing it in a trauma informed way for the people that are, um, you know, suffering from the trauma. Remind yourself that taking time pause can improve your health. Rest is an act of self care and healing. This message is to everybody, but it's also to the people that have been working so hard on the Buffalo response specifically, myself included. We need to make sure that we're taking care of ourselves. We're eating, we're drinking water, we're getting our rest. It's important because we're not able to push forward and be the parents or workers or whatever we need to be if we're not doing those things. Also stay connected with others. Identify specific triggers. 
consider getting involved in activism if that's a thing that is interesting to you but also have an understanding that it might not be a thing that you're interested in doing and that's okay too right some people are activists some people are are are, are you know we all play our role and i think that that's been one of the interesting things i've learned in this position as omh's chief diversity officer is that everybody plays their own little role different role in how they're all working to make the world a better place right some people do it in the micro right some people do it in the macro some but 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 we all do it in different ways um but you find a way that that, that is going to be um, meaningful and useful for you. So I can pick up these slides. Uh, thank you so much. Matthew. When we look at reactions to trauma, they are a range of reactions, right? So here you will see emotional, such as crying and or despair. Uh, that is part and parcel, if you will, particularly for shocking events like a mass shooting here in Buffalo. Yes, intense sobbing, while at the same time, intense consoling. Feelings of despair, but also feelings of determination. So the reactions range uh, across the board, actually. Behavioral, for instance, such as even withdrawing, uh, engaging, uh, even sometimes in, in the conflict in terms of, well, that's not what I mean, or that's you're misunderstanding me. Trying to make sure, though, oftentimes in these situations that people are given the space to react in the way that they react. And for us, others, whoever might be on the opposite end, whether you're a consoler, or whether you're someone who is just in that person's support system, to allow that space uh, for those reactions to be authentic from the individual. And of course, uh, using substances can be a reaction as well. And we realize how important it is to be mindful of how that can be damaging uh, in more ways than one. So as allies, as, as Matthew has already talked about, it will be important to be conscious and to be on the lookout, if you will, for how these reactions laid out, how these reactions are actually seen and how they can experience or are experienced, if you will, by the individual. And if there are concerns or warning signs, then we need to also seek additional help for that individual. Be mindful, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, physiology is an important part of our reaction as well. So physiological responses uh, to trauma are real. T, for instance, intense fatigue, and sometimes even pain around how you know, such a shock, such a horrific event could have happened. That pain is felt oftentimes within one's physiology. So these are reactions. Again, they vary. They also could be reactions that are felt from a cultural perspective as well, both individual and cultural. Next slide. Cognitive, in terms of reactions to trauma, could include forgetfulness or ability to focus. Uh, and that's, again, a piece that we understand because of the sheer confusion of how could this have happened, right? And almost even compartmentalizing, if I can put that word in air quotation marks, what has happened and realizing that I still have other things that I need to do, but maybe not able to concentrate on those things. So forgetfulness and ability to focus would be common reactions. Also, we should be mindful that there's a spiritual uh, component uh, to reactions to trauma. There could be even feelings of hope and or hopelessness. How does that play out in reference to one's connectivity to the universe in terms of how they understand their spiritual well being? Others may feel that their spiritual well being is connected to a deity, right? Um, God, 
Allah, some higher power. However, that may play out here where that is coming from in terms of the individual who's experiencing trauma. And of course, no prejudging. I'm open to where that person is with his or her or their spiritual well being. Next slide. So feeling afraid and unsafe, that's again part and parcel of experiencing or being on the receiving end, should I say, of a traumatic event such as mass violence. Mass violence is shocking and it can make you feel unsafe, right? Uh, have fearful emotions. Fear and not feeling safe are common reactions after mass violence. We understand that to be the case. If people were killed at places you go, doing things you do, it is normal to feel scared and unsafe. We've already talked about that in reference to kind of the just normality of going to the grocery store and how that now has been usurped because of this shooter's spree. That's really a concern for how people also connect with others. So if we use the grocery store as an example again, and clearly that is what happened on Jefferson Avenue here in Buffalo at Topps uh, Supermarket. It's more than just a grocery store. It's also a community gathering place. It's a place where people connect with each other. And now that has been taken away on top of, of course, the horrific lives that have been lost. Fears for yourself and your loved ones who are BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, people of color, and religious minorities are heightened in situations like this, in mass violence like this, in the unthinkable and many would say unspeakable mass shooting. Next slide. So some other typical reactions that we will see in children, behavioral challenges, play themselves out by way of tantrums, arguing, of course, and even fighting. Again, it's a coping mechanism, unhealthy from the standpoint of, we know that those reactions could play out in more negative ways, but it is a coping mechanism. So how do we move unhealthy coping mechanisms to healthy ones? And again, therein lies the response, the mental health response, the support factor response, all of those pieces make a big difference. Regressions, such as setbacks and sleeping and toileting, absolutely are reactions children have in these situations. Reacting physically, such as stomach aches and headaches, again, going back to the physiology piece and how that plays out for children in acute ways, actually. Anxiety, difficulty, even separating or feeling issues of separation. So there is going to be the need to create spaces or at least a zone of safety for children because they're watching the news, they're watching social media as well. And so they may not fully understand depending on the age, but nonetheless, how are we addressing that peace, if you will, with our children so that their coping mechanisms are more healthy. And they also may be avoiding a situation or even fearful to go outside. Typical reactions. And we might even see some violence in their play or storytelling. Be on the watch out or the lookout, if you will, for that. Fears about sounds and sights. Again, all trauma reminders or triggers, if you will, particularly when those trauma reminders or triggers are so very close to when actual attack, in this case, mass shooting took place. Nonetheless, we know they can also happen over time as well. Next slide. And typical reactions of adolescence. We know that in our society, adolescents 
the period of adolescence is a period where young people are trying to discover themselves, even explore who they are in terms of their mindset, how they view the world, and how they form and maintain relationships. So when a mass shooting occurs or mass violence, as we have explained, the reactions can be cute for adolescents just as they are for children. Feeling sad, scared, confused, even numb, hopelessness. Feelings of guilt are that life is meaningless. And that's so important to be mindful of because what we don't want is for self-inflicted harm to occur. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Change in sleeping habits, even change in uh, eating in terms of frequency or eating more than the average. Some might even refer to it as binge eating. Difficulty concentrating on schoolwork, absolutely. Are we allowing for space in the school settings and certainly at home when we think about adolescents and their reaction to mass violence? Intense engagement with social media, gaming, even while sometimes engaging less in outside technology. So you can see the range here as well. We wanna pay attention to that because we also want to be mindful of what they're watching, if, it, if at all possible, and what they are engaging in because oftentimes social media is related to self-esteem, right? How many followers do I have? How many likes am I getting with this post? So on and so forth. But if the post is one that is uh, unhealthy, I will refer to it in that sense, are we helping our adolescent young person to see this in a different light and being a support to him, her, or them in this process? Serious unsafe behaviors like self-harm using substances must be given acute attention. We don't want self-harm to play itself out in a fatalistic way or it's referring to suicide or anything that relates to self-harm. We want to be able to intervene appropriately. And we also want to be able to provide the support on an ongoing basis. Again, typical reactions of adolescents. Next slide. And so our coping tools don't underestimate the basics, is the heading here. Eat well, right? If we can facilitate a healthy diet, even in the midst of experiencing or experiencing, it's very important because we want our physical health to be maintained. Stay hydrated. Engage in physical activity. Whatever that physical activity may be, and it actually may be something as... Uh, simple, but also something as important as a walk, whatever that may be, but physical activity has its place. Bathe, dress, comb hair, sleep well, and in a routine. Again, sleeping can be one of those areas of concern because there has, for many folks who I've talked to in Buffalo, there have been many sleepless nights in the last two weeks. Nonetheless, if we can facilitate opportunities for all of us in these traumatic events to still get the requisite amount of sleep, it helps our body to rejuvenate. Purposeful activity, time outside, take time to check in with yourself. In other words, that self-care around all of these various areas that we've talked about is so critically important. Self-care with group care meaning checking in with our loved ones, our friends as well, who may not be adequately engaging in the self-care that they need. And downtime, allowing ourselves to have downtime. Those of us who are quote unquote uh, workaholics, and I've used that term, but I also know that it has a number of different uh, meanings. 
are we engaging in downtime, allowing ourselves just to sit and to absorb? These are all coping tools, but again, don't underestimate the basics. So I'll turn it over now back to Matthew for the next few slides. Thank you. So it's important, you know, a couple other mentions of, of, of what works, what helps us have, you know, um, you know, what helps us heal is take one thing at a time. And, and, and for people that are stressed in, or, in ordinary workload can sometimes become unbearable. And I think that that's something, you know, to point out that most of us in, you know, most of us are normal work day full already. Um, but one of the things that you'll notice is that, you know, it will seem like the things that you may have been able to do not under that stress might be a little bit more um, difficult. So take one urgent task and work on it. And once you accomplish that task, choose the next one. This is something I struggle with personally. Um, but one of the things that's proven is that the idea that multitasking is going to have you get more things done um, actually is proven to, to, to not necessarily be the case. Focus on one thing that you need to be accomplished, that you need to accomplish. Um, check off tasks, checking off tasks, give you a sense of accomplishment and make the overall bigger picture seem less overwhelming. When you look at all of your picture, all the things you need to do like this, it's obviously going to be overwhelming. But when you make a list and quantify it, then you're able to kind of name each piece. Do something positive, give blood, uh, prepare care packages, donate, write letters, participate in advocacy, volunteer. I think that that's an important stuff. That's an important piece. You know, it's one of the pieces that that, that we know, um, you know, is used traditionally in other healing method, methods, such as 12 step programs is doing, giving, being of service, partially because it gives us purpose to the activities that we're doing. Having purpose and doing something and being a part of the solution um, is actually proven to be able to be one of the ways that we're going to be able to heal and that we're able to move forward from extremely, extremely difficult things. And helping other people does give us a sense of purpose um, in a situation that oftentimes might feel out of control. <clears throat> Limit media and social media exposure this is extremely important. And after mass violence, media and social media coverage is consistent. Um, and you might be tempted to stay glued to your phone, but this can cause even more distress. Try to disconnect from the news and social media for at least several hours every day. If you watch TV or being on your phone helps you cope, turn on a movie, watch a channel that doesn't have news alerts or play a game. This one right here is critical, right? And when I can bring it all the way back to the beginning of COVID, Right where um, me personally, I think everybody was just scrolling and sitting, waiting for what the next piece of news related to COVID was going to be. Um, but I realized that you know that it was actually causing more harm than good. It was making me more anxious. It was making me more overwhelmed. And you know, once we got the fee feedback and started learning that one of the things that you need to do is unplug a little bit. I really then could really understand and see that um, how anxious I was was actually directly corresponded to how much I was scrolling and how much I was watching the news. Um, so we want to make sure that we're getting the news and such to be able to live our lives and do our jobs and such. But there is a way that we can make sure that we can actually overdo it and we end up getting too much. Find things to enjoy and it's, and it's okay to disengage, right? Give yourself permission no matter what, to have fun and to laugh, right? That's an important healing and coping skill. And there's a lot of different ways that we can do that. But we all know the therapeutic value of laughter, right? That will never change. It is always important. And due to technology and different things that we do have now, it's easy to be able to go and find funny videos or I do stand up. I go on YouTube and watch whole full stand up sets, right? An hour. I try to do that for at least 15 minutes a day. And it actually is, it actually is useful for your mood. Um, and it's a very useful um, strategy. Consider doing something you really enjoy every single day, no matter what. 
Um, you have to make a commitment um, to the commitment to do something every day. Um, sometimes you might have to schedule time to do it, but make it a very, very specific point. And I could not, I, I, I cannot overstate this enough, um, is that make sure if you have to put it in your schedule, if you have to put it in your calendar, for those of us that have a lot of other things going on, which that's all of us, we have kids, we have, you know, extracurricular activities, we have our, our job, it is still important. And the busier you are, the more important it is to make sure that you're at least spending a little bit of time each day doing something that you thoroughly enjoy. Coping by connecting is another thing. Um, this year, the Office of Mental Health Suicide Prevention Conference is specifically focused on making connections, right? And it's important because we, we connection is one of the struggles that we've had over the last few years. Communities and people have become a little bit more isolated. Some of it just common sense wise is just because of the social isolating that we've had to do um, in response to being safe at the individual and community level because of COVID. Um, but it's important that we stay connected with individuals. Find times to connect with your family, friends, and other people who make you feel more relaxed. By talking with others about what you're going through, no matter what it is, you can relieve stress and realize that others share the same feelings as you. Don't cut off yourself from loved ones. Find a way to help others through volunteering or, like I said, finding things that give you purpose. Be compassionate with yourself and be gentle with your expectations. With yourself that's that's an important one the third bullet is important you're on your own timeline and there is no timeline for healing right so it, never ever ever put yourself in a position where you're saying um i shouldn't be here or i should be farther along or i shouldn't still be feeling like this that shame and that guilt that 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 shouldn't be that you should not be putting on yourself. Everybody's process is different. And remember, it's proven psychologically that something might be something that happened six months, two years, three years, ten years ago. And because of the way our brains work and that healing works, we might have intensified symptoms even at you know time periods that are well far after an event. It's important also to ask for support if you need a break. If you're worried about how someone is coping, check in with them and let them know that you care, that you care. Check in with people who may be affected, especially um, people of color, friends and loved ones who you know might belong, who, who are black, um, people of color generally, and people from other communities that face discrimination in, a, in, in, in our state, in America. Because again, um, you have to remember, like I said, that, that, that when one group um, is really the victim like this, other groups still, whether it's somebody in the LGBTQ community or somebody else, it's very triggering because um, there's almost this family, right, of, 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 of the marginalized, right? There's this family of, of, of groups and people, and, and that includes women, that includes, um, you know, people in the LGBTQ community, that includes um, immigrants, that includes um, people that have various other additional disabilities. You know, we're, we're, we're all together in, 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 in that kind of um, group, and it's important for us to look out for others who are also marginalized and, um, you know, hurt in many ways. Now to talk a little bit about helping children. Um, it's important to talk to your children. Ask them what they know. Avoid pushing if they are not ready and keep offering. Um, normalize feelings of anxiety, stress, guilt, sadness, and fear. Um, understand that children of color may also have different and more intense reactions. Um, promote your child's coping skills. And this is a very, very important one, not only for our young folks, but also for us. Keep routines and expectations going and provide some extra check-ins. Um, that's the thing that I'll state as well, is that consistency and routine um, are kind of the things that provide the anchor or that provide that foundation for young people, especially to feel safe um, and, 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 and feel able to be kind of on a longer term um, path to healing. Additionally, bring in your network to support you and your children. If you're struggling, reach out to other people, whether that's family members, friends, or other people in your community. Um, address head-on dangerous behaviors. 
help young adolescents, this is more specific to adolescents, understand that dangerous behaviors can sometimes have a way, be a way to express difficult feelings and help identify alternatives for them. Again, for them as well, and this is a big struggle with young people, I have young people, uh, limit media and social media use as much as possible. Um, I think that in the same way, um, I've seen it in my, my, my children, I, in, in the same way that I talked about some of the kind of, you know, added anxiety or stress or whatever that I get, it's the same way for young people. Um, the same messaging, the same, you know, um, information that is, is given out in a very steady stream um, for adults is the same stuff that, that, that young people get. Um, and again, it's important to seek support for yourself and your child as needed. Um, remember, it, you might need help, your child might need help, you might both need help, but it's important to reach out if you need it. Um, that's a critical piece. And, 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 and part of that is to, um, you know, I think part of the overall message here is that feeling different and having these challenges is the trauma response. It's normal. It's a normal response and that there's nothing um, shameful or that there's nothing different or weird or strange, that this is the expectation that people, um, many people are going to be having these responses. Um, so it's just important for us to reach out and make sure that we're getting uh, the, the professional support, if needed, um, to be able to address these concerns. Now I am going to turn it back over to Stephen. Thanks, Matt. So you know, Matt and Dr. Alfred have both talked about some really simple concepts. And, and at times, the advice that we're handing out or the suggestions we're making um, seem like common sense. They, they're very straightforward. Uh, limit social media exposure and TV exposure, especially for kids. Connect to the people in your community and your family that have helped you in previous times cope with challenges. The reason why is because we know from studying traumatic events and mass shootings, we know that those behaviors make a difference. That by doing things right now, and that's what this, this little arrow is trying to describe, by doing those things consciously, right now when sometimes it's hard to hold on to common sense and things that that used to be normal before two weeks ago but by doing that you have the opportunity to process and challenge and work through things that if left unaddressed later and down the road in years from now tend to turn into bigger issues and bigger challenges and greater challenges to long-term mental health. So our focus here today is to talk to you about these things that you can be doing now that are going to make a difference down the road. All of this is really a package of activities that some folks put together a number of years ago from the Child Traumatic Stress Network um, that's called psychological first aid. It's really the kind of thing that's similar to physical first aid. It's how do you deal with an immediate challenge, not one that's going to take you to the hospital right away, not one that's going to require a doctor's intervention. But what are some simple things to address challenges that you have in the psychological response to the events that we've just gone through? And as I've been saying, these are really things that sound like common sense, and they really are. And one is that you want to make sure that your physical safety is assured, that you keep yourself from future stresses. So if there are places you might go that would increase stress, avoid them. If there are ways that you can make yourself feel more secure at home or where you go shopping or what streets you walk, take them. Doesn't have to be permanent changes in your behavior, but acknowledge that now is a challenging period of time and you want to make sure that you're taking care of that sense of safety because it's going to help you deal with all of the other challenges that you have less control over. 
calming yourself. It's easy to get ratcheted up emotionally. There are issues that are on the table now in your communities that are challenging, but make sure that those don't become the pre predominant ways that you look at what's occurred. Find time to calm yourself, to try to find a place of avoidance of things that are going to add stress. One of the things that is the most important is to remind yourself and the people around you that you've been through challenges and that each one of us has within ourselves strengths, resources, abilities, ways of behaving, ways of solving problems, of addressing challenges, and remembering what those are or helping somebody remember where their strengths and resources are is a way to create both efficacy for yourself, but also it tends to build this community-wide efficacy, this ability to overcome challenges that are uh, confronting you. Another one is, is something that Matt spoke to specifically is that connectedness. We are social animals, we're social beings and interacting with individuals around us creates and, and adds to those personal strengths that we have. And finally, hope. The reactions that all of us are facing, they're reasonable. Being angry, being sad, being frustrated, being overwhelmed, all of these are reactions to some very, very challenging circumstances. As I said, remembering where you have coped with challenges that you've had in the past, reminding folks around you of the challenges they've overcurred, overcome in the past are ways to build hope going forward. There are reactions that are not easily overcome. And if you find that you or someone close to you or someone you know is exhibiting challenges and behaviors that they are not able to control, they may be exhibiting, they may be having post-traumatic stress reactions. That is not PTSD, which is a disorder and a, a very real and treatable illness, but that is, is not yet going to be something that um, someone would be diagnosed with, but they may be having challenges like intrusive reactions. That means that there are thoughts that keep coming back to them that they simply cannot keep out of their minds. And they keep coming and coming and taking them off the track of finding some calmness or finding a way to gain some control over their thoughts and, and what they wish to do. They may exhibit avoidance or withdrawal reactions where they just stop talking, they stop communicating, they turn inward, they try everything to, that they can to try to put the events that they have reacted to or that they've come into contact with um, to keep themselves safe. They may become emotionally numb, very detached. If you start seeing those behaviors in yourself, if you see them in, in someone else, that's a concern. And it's something to bring to their, their attention, someone else's attention, uh, if it becomes a regular challenge. And the other one is physical arousal reactions. And that's if you're having difficulty sleeping or you can't concentrate. Uh, or that you've become irritable and jumpy and very nervous uh, and constantly aware and ready to jump at something, um, that is an arousal reaction that is not healthy. It's not, well, it's to be expected. If it begins to become overwhelming, that is a concern to pay attention to. If you see those things, if 
in loved ones, people that you're close to, people that you care about, you seek help. And while all kinds of reactions that we've described are reasonable and, and not unusual, they can become serious. Understand that health is available in your community in many, many ways. We're going to speak to that in just a moment. But hold on to a, a, a reality, and that is that in asking for help, it is not a, a recognition of weakness um, or a sign that, that you don't have the ability to cope. It's a sign that you are strong enough to get the assistance that you need to go on and to recover, and that ultimately is the goal. Mentioned resources, if you feel that there are challenges, um, there are all kinds of services, cl clinical mental health services locally in every community, mental health crisis services, and Project HOPE services that we spoke about much earlier in, in our presentation, where you can contact either of these two local organizations, the Buffalo Urban League Project HOPE, or Spectrum Project Hope. They have counselors that are in the community, or you can call the Project Hope um, Lifeline. One of the resources that's, uh, there are a number of resources that are available 24 seven. One is a federal, a national disaster distress helpline that connects callers to people that can provide counseling assistance. There's the 24 hour crisis text line for folks that are much more comfortable on a mobile device. There are resources for those that are hard of hearing. There's the national suicide prevention lifeline that is available either online or via 1-800-273-TALK. It's available also in Spanish. And as I mentioned, the New York Project HOPE Emotional Support Helpline, which operates seven days a week uh, from eight to 10. And there you will get a live counselor online that can provide assistance and support. And lastly, there are numerous links and ways to get additional information. All these are live links, and I believe that we will have a way of uh, giving you access to a PDF of this presentation. It will include these live links from numerous sources, both general, like the New York State Office of Mental Health, that will take you to a page with a lot of resources listed one at a time, or some very specific things like tips for how you cope with traumatic events or um, coping with stress, finding a mass shooting. All of these are very uh, accessible in terms of how the information is pre presented uh, and available at a click. All of the ones on this page, you can find just by going to the governor's website um, Governor Hochul's website um, for the response to Buffalo. Just more of those resources. Now, Matt, if you'd like to speak to any of these in particular. No, not specifically, but I just wanted to just add, um, you know, some a couple other things. And I think that we're pretty much at the end of the presentation at this point. Um, and unfortunately, just because of the large audience, we're not really able to take, um, you know, live questions. But I wanted to make sure um, that people knew that they could reach out to us at any time if they have any, um, you know, questions about any of the material that's been given. Um, and just a little bit more specifics, um, some broadly about questions that we've been getting related to the little bit more specific Buffalo response. Um, has been is, is to just mention one of the things that we are um, 
paying special attention to is making sure that services delivered are able to be delivered and being delivered by people of color, specifically black individuals. That's been very, um, you know, that's not been lost on anybody. And that's something that directly from the beginning, we have um, concrete, you know, boots on the ground, people providing these services who are black. Um, the other is that the other services as well that are coming down the pike that are more longer term, we're working on getting up and running within the next um, seven days, a statewide, um, you know, a statewide healing circle, which will be virtual support groups, um, but done in an Afrocentric way. Um, so they're going to be healing circles that are specifically, um, you know, culturally tailored to the black population. People will be able to call in, log in and be able to participate in, in these. And this is a little bit broader than Buffalo. It's um, anybody in the state will be able to participate. So stay tuned on more information about that. Um, and then just lastly, I just wanted to mention, um, you know, everybody in the state, um, it, it, you know, including the people in Buffalo, obviously have a commitment from Governor Hochul's office. Um, you know, the White House's eyes are on this, as well as being interested in making sure that services are available to help that community heal, both in the short and the long term. And then the Office of Mental Health in the same way that we're dedicated to making sure that we're able to help the community heal. Um, and we have a number of great partners that we've been working with. And, and I think overall, out of all the different resources that we have, I think that um, the biggest one is the heartbeat of the black community in Buffalo. I think that that is the biggest strength that we're capitalizing on now um, is there's going to be support that's going to come from all of us, um, different levels of government, different organizations. But this is being driven by the community um, and it's being driven by the spirit um, in the heartbeat again of the Buffalo black community. So we're proud to be a part of these activities to be able to assist um, that community in healing. So those are the closing words that I have. Um, I, Steve and, 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 and Dr. Alfred might have a couple more, um, but thank you everyone. Um, oh, and one, one more thing, and then, and then looks like Dr. Alfred wants to say something. So we've been getting a flood of interest in this. Um, if you have contacts or resources, clinical, volunteer, food, anything like that for the folks in Buffalo, um, and you'd like to sh share that support, you can shoot me an email. Um, and we're one of the, you know, conduits, if you will, that's currently taking um, these resources and then finding a way to make them uh, able to be, uh, you know, useful for the people that are in the Buffalo area. So thank you, everyone. Dr. Alfred. Thank you. And I just want to reiterate that, and as you heard from Matthew, you know, there are currently circles being formed uh, to help with um, the healing process. But I also want to just reiterate that there is no time frame. There is no timetable associated with uh, the grief process or trauma uh, in reference to how one experiences it. So uh, we know that uh, that will vary depending on the individual, while at the same time, so many people want to engage and rightly so in action-oriented uh, response. And that too is a process of working through or healing as, as Matthew has indicated, but no, no timetable. So I don't want us to, again, be uh, boxed in, if you will. Oh, well, I've been at this for a week now. It may be a year. It may be even longer than that. It just depends. Nonetheless, the support systems that we've already talked about, Steve has alluded to as well with uh, the wonderful resources that we've provided in this PowerPoint, that is critical, and we want to be mindful that uh, support has to be ongoing, and it, and it will be. This type of trauma is not just felt by one individual. It's a humanity uh, experience in terms of all of humanity has been impacted by uh, this traumatic event. And every event, sadly for us to even say that there are multiple events, as we have already seen yesterday in Texas, but every event deserves its acute and special attention. So we want to be mindful of how critical that is as well. That's all that I have to say, and I do appreciate everyone's participation in this webinar. Thank you, everyone. Have a, have a great rest of your afternoon.